Now, you've often heard me say that the lectionary is kind of restrictive, that it doesn't really tell us the story before and the story after. And the Gospels are meant to be written, read rather, straight through. They aren't meant to be chopped up like this over a three-year period. We just do that for convenience sake. But this is one of those times when I'm actually glad the lectionary kind of chopped this one up because these two parables are part of a threesome of parables. And the third parable that we're not going to get into next week, actually, um, is the prodigal son. And that tends to overshadow these two smaller parables. So this Sunday, we're almost forced to pay a little more attention to two parables that are utterly, totally thrown away. And before I really get into the content, I want to show you this book. It's a book that I would... Um, love to spend time talking about in the future if, if, it's, if it's something that we, we do or appropriate. It's called Short Stories by Jesus, and it goes through um, 10 parables, but from a perspective of a Hebrew person in the first century. Um, Amy Jill Levine is one of my absolute favorite authors, and she's a Jewish scholar who writes on Christian history, so I, she was featured heavily in my MA uh, thesis. But she brilliantly goes through what the Hebrew people and the Jewish people would hear in these parables rather than what we as Christians in the 21st century hear. Because so many of the parables are read through our perspective. And I talked about that a little bit about a couple months ago when we were looking at the Good Samaritan and how we always identify ourselves with the Samaritan and not necessarily the person that got beat up. The thing with the parables is that they ask us to put ourselves in every shoe, not just the one we like, but every shoe of parts of the parable. And we've got two parallel, parallel parables here. I dare anyone to say that five times fast. And they're looking at the same thing. Something is lost and it is found and there's great celebration. Same method in, in the two of them. And there's a story of a man and a story of a woman, so there's, there's paralleling there as well. Um, but a lot of times when modern Western society looks at these parables, first of all, they assume the woman is poor because she's desperately looking for money. And what, rich people don't look for money? Um, the other thing is looking at the shepherd or looking at the lost sheep. And they obviously, they, they automatically assume it's a shepherd that lost the sheep. So leaves 99 by themselves in the wilderness, which no farmer is going to do, and goes off and finds his lost sheep. And it's through these simplistic interpretations that almost everybody reads these parables. And I read voraciously, and I could not find many people who deviated from those assumptions. But if you look at the parables as a whole, within the culture that would have heard them the first time, they would have heard something very different. First of all, no farmer, no shepherd has a hundred sheep. That's a rich man's place to be. Um, the owner of these sheep noticed something was missing and went looking while his staff was doing their job. The 99 were perfectly taken care of. The owner, seeing everything available, I mean, when you look at a group of 100 sheep, can you tell whether it's 98, 95, 90? Like, how do you do that? Same with a woman looking for 10 coins. Now, those of us who have to manage tight budgets, we're a little more conscious than maybe people who don't have to budget quite as tightly, but 10 coins you kind of notice when one's not missing, but maybe you don't. If you just look really quickly at a, at a clump of coins, can you tell the difference between 9 and 10? You really can't. So the whole idea of these parables is that the woman and the man looked, they counted, they looked to see what was missing. They paid attention to what they should have had and noticed something was gone. And in both parables, these two characters are identified with God, that God looks at us and sees who's missing, but also what's missing. See, the thing with only seeing ourselves in one perspective in a parable is that we fail to kind of get a grasp of what is probably going on and what we have to learn. If we see ourselves as the owners who are losing something, that's very different than if we see ourselves as people who have missing something, who have that 10% or that 1% missing from our very beings. 
But that's the message that the first century would have heard. That it's not just we're missing money or we're missing sheep, but we're missing something in us as well. It's both meanings simultaneously. That God cares enough to look at a church like this and say, okay, I am missing a lot of my folk. How do I now go out and get them? That's where it comes into us being the hands and feet of God, which is basically on repeat if you're a Christian. How do I go and reach the people who are not here, who are missing, who are missing out on the point? How do I do that? But it's also looking at us each individually. Okay, what is missing in you? What is the part that keeps you from being whole and complete? The Hebrew numbering system also adds into this because Hebrews had a very strong sense of numerology. There, the Aleph, Aleph Bet had equivalency in numbers. And just because I'm a geek, I looked up, the number zero was not invented until the fifth century. So Hebrews didn't have a zero. Everything went from one to 10, that was their block. 10 was completion. And they started over again at 11, and 11 was complete. And they did numbers kind of like the French do with 70 and 80, you know? If you were to translate that in English, it's like 610 or 4020. Um, Hebrews had that style of numbering. So everything had a base of 10. So for them, a 10 was a complete number. And we see numbers pop up. I mean, 12 is a popular number, 40 is a popular number. These are numbers that pop up, and they meant something to the first century audience that has lost on us at this stage in the life. But they meant that, it's, whether it's 100, whether it's 10, whether it's two, something is not complete. And we have to find that completion. So Jesus gives us these parables. And it's set after the people who are in charge of making sure everybody behaves properly have said, why are you spending time with these people who are just not the kind of people we would associate with? Why are you spending time with sinners, tax collectors? Why are you spending time with the homeless? Why are you spending time with the people who are sick? And you have to understand that again in, in the Hebrew culture. If you were a person who was sick, you were spiritually punished. So you wouldn't associate with someone who was ill because first of all, they were already marked by God as inappropriate, but they might be contagious. And in a society that didn't know how to deal with leprosy, that was a real thing. Tax collectors, I mean, we throw that around. The, the whole idea of tax collectors is not that money was evil. It's that tax collectors were in league with Rome. They were seen as traitors for their own culture. And they also did not deal with people honestly in many cases. So people disassociated from them. They could have been wealthy, they could have been well-to-do, all sorts of things, but they betrayed the Hebrew culture and sided with the Romans. So they were on the outside of society. Prostitutes come up, um, homeless come up. All of these folks that Jesus routinely mentions that are needed to pull into the community to be made whole. And Jesus' first response to these Pharisees who want to exclude people is the fact that, no, the kingdom of God is about inclusion, about including people more. And I am absolutely convinced that the reason we don't include people is because they don't, people outside of us don't know the difference. They don't know that they're welcome here. They don't know that Christianity is about serving each other. They don't know that I can walk out the church this morning and literally run smack dab into people having a conversation that don't even know I'm there, which is cool, by the way. They don't know that this church spends a good 20 minutes afterwards just checking in. They don't know that because they're not here to know that. People walk in the door and they're scared that they haven't got the right uh, combination of behavior and sinlessness. They're not good enough. They don't know that everybody sitting here knows that we're not good enough either. They don't know that. And the only way they're going to know that is if we now put ourselves in the character of God in this parable. Not in a grandeur way, but in being that character that goes out looking for the ones who are lost. I mean, how many times this week have one of you had tea or coffee with someone? Has church come up at all? And you don't have to answer me because I can tell you how many times it comes up for me. 
When you're on social media, do you, use converse, do you have conversations about religion at all? We're raised in a culture that says, you don't talk about that, that's not polite. You start talking about religion, you start dividing people. I had this conversation with Melanie and, and Tanessa before I even started church this morning, that people see this as a big divide, we don't want to talk about our faith. Yeah, we do. We do want to talk about it. Because the lost is not only in us, it should be amongst us. And why are they not here? Why do they think they have to dress a particular way before they're good enough to walk in that door? What message have we sent that we expect a certain level of behavior? I would love to be in a church where the prostitutes working hard Saturday night can kind of come in here and just relax. You know, maybe they fall asleep. My God, they've earned it. But they sit among us and no one says, oh, you've been doing things that I don't agree with. We don't do that. We just welcome them. Or the people who are hungry, and there's hunger in this community. I know there is come here and say, I just can't function. And someone goes looking for food, and they eat a muffin on the seat, and they make a mess everywhere, but they're here. Or the child's going to scream their head off, and the only thing they want to do is stand up here with me while I preach, hold my hand. I want that kid here. Why are they not here? What do we have to do to be the ones who go out and find the lost? Because every single one of you knows how to do it. You've got to talk about faith. You've got to make it so normal that people look at you and say, oh yeah, right, you, you do that thing, right? And it's so normal that people kind of say, well, you know, Christmas is coming. I really don't get the whole thing about why you have to have the nativity when Santa's just right there. And then you can talk about that. Rua doesn't think she's very well educated, by the way. She thinks that she's, uh, it's blind leading the blind at Sunday school this morning. Um, she doesn't remember, but at four years old, we were walking in the beaches in Toronto, and she actually went into a store, asked for the manager. When the manager came up, she said, thank them for having the real symbolism of Christmas in the window. This manager is floored. She has no memory of this. I do. But they had nativity. Like, where are nativities? Where are our arcs? Where are our our mountains and our symbols and our pictures and our stories and our excitement. Where are we with Jesus saying, we're all children, welcome onto God's lap. Why are we not doing that? And so the parable is trying to challenge us this morning. When something is lost in us or in our community, we're not only the one left behind, we're not only the one that is lost, but the one is, we're also the ones that are supposed to find them. So that's my challenge to you. And that's God's challenge to you. When you read the gospel, go find people. You've got family visiting, bring them to church. Bring them to church. They don't have to come again if they don't like it, but you know what? They're not going to know that they're going to enjoy it if they don't come in the first place. They don't know the community is here. Invite people in. Don't opt out. Because the kingdom of God is for everyone. No one, including me, has all the answers. We are all on a journey, and it's a heck of a lot more fun to journey with someone than to do it alone.